In 2022, Reverend Jake Morrill stepped down after 19 years as lead minister of the UU congregation in Oak Ridge, Texas. These days, he consults with businesses toward cultures of greater emotional maturity and better relationship management skills. He's published five books, the most recent last year, on the topic of keeping boundaries at work and at home. Jake and his wife, Molly, are the proud parents of two teenagers. Please help me in welcoming our guest speaker this morning, Reverend Jake Morrell. When our heart is in a holy place, that's one of my favorite hymns. Not when my heart is in a holy place, that's one thing, but when our heart is in a holy place, that's another. That's the depth of community right there. Our heart in a holy place. If it only, if it only weren't for those other people messing things up. On this July 4th weekend, when we reflect on the fragile practice of democracy and sharing life with others, that's what I want to talk about. And I'll start with a story. Once upon a time, there was a congregation that was pretty happy with how things went for the most part. They liked to sing together. They liked to gather for potlucks. They didn't do so bad at the annual pledge campaign, but there was one problem they could not resolve, the church kitchen. From week to week, people would wander through the building, get themselves a mug of coffee or a glass of water, and when they were done, just leave the mug or glass in the sink, as if somebody else, some magical being, would flutter down from the rafters to wash out the mug or the glass for them at some later point. The church kitchen sink problem gnawed at a few of them. You see, there were a few of them who were the responsible ones in the church. The responsible ones were those hardy souls who identified problems and then rolled up their sleeves to solve them. In the case of the sink full of dirty mugs and glasses, the responsible ones said to each other, well, it's only a matter of putting up a sign. After all, that's only the kind of reminder that they themselves would need. So they put up a sign. It said, please wash out your dirty mugs and glasses. Written in neat magic marker, it was hung on the cabinet over the sink, but a week went by, and then two, and nothing in the mug and glass situation, as people had begun to talk about it, had changed. In fact, the growing collection of mugs and glasses in the sink was somehow worse for the presence of the sign, which clearly asked people to wash out their mugs and glasses. The responsible ones huddled again. They realized that what was needed was a better sign one with stronger language. So they put up a new sign this time. It said, things are getting out of control with this dirty mug and glass situation. You must wash them yourselves. They were especially pleased that the word must was underlined. Surely this would drive the point home. But week after week, the conditions in the sink remained the same, except that somebody had now drawn a smiley face on the sign. So the responsible ones, once again gathered. This, they decided, was a matter for the Board of Trustees. At the board meeting, they celebrated the responsible ones did when a motion they proposed had passed. The motion said that anyone found to have violated the wash your own mug and glass policy would immediately have the right to use church kitchen dinnerware revoked. Finally, some clarity and consequences, and from the board no less. But guess what happened? That's right. More dirty mugs, more dirty glasses. The responsible ones, three weeks later, gathered in the living room of one of the most responsible ones to talk over this crisis. It wasn't, they told each other, a matter only of dirty mugs and dirty glasses. This was now a matter of principle. The dirty mugs and glasses, one of them said, was a symbol for the general lawlessness and disrespect now taking root in the culture of the congregation. Things hadn't always been this way, another one added. Why, 20 years ago, people knew the value of washing out mugs and cleaning out glasses, but now, well, obviously, this was one of the downsides of congregational growth that people don't talk about. This blatant disregard for uh, rules that newcomers had brought with them coming in the front door. The responsible ones ended that four-hour conversation in the living room with the only solution they could think of at that point an armed guard. 
several of them agreed that they would give specially earmarked money to the church for the sole purpose of, hi of hiring a rotation of armed guards to stand over the sink, monitoring the use of mugs and glasses and ensuring that none were left dirty for someone else to wash. And so this is what the congregation did from then on. Now, some of the guards were nice and uh, liked to help out, so that was good, but everyone knew that they were there in the church kitchen because in the end, you just can't trust people to wash their own mugs and glasses. As much as the congregation talked about community on Sundays, about building trust and love between people, when it comes to some things, you need rules and the means to enforce them if there's going to be order. So that's the story about church kitchens and dirty mugs and glasses. It may seem completely strange and unfamiliar to you who share life in a congregation, uh, but it's also a story about human society and about how some assumptions lead to some conclusions such as armed guards standing in a church kitchen. Instead of a church kitchen, this story could have been told about a neighborhood park or a whole neighborhood or a city or a state or a country or the world. When groups of people have something in common to manage, whether a sink in the church kitchen or air quality in a region, time and again people end up with those solutions with the uh, delusion that human nature has a tendency toward selfishness and toward exploiting one's neighbors. And that dim view of human nature and the assumption that society requires mechanisms of control is against the grains of the claims we make as Unitarian Universalists regarding interdependence. As you may know, the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association in Pittsburgh, a little over a week ago, uh, delegates voted to approve moving forward consideration of Article 2 of the denominational bylaws. Now, for almost 40 years, Article 2 has been known in shorthand as the seven principles. Now, after a long process of deliberation and input and revision, there is a proposal that the seven principles would be eclipsed by a new articulation of what Unitarian Universalists hold in common, six shared values with a seventh love at the center. You can look those up yourselves and join in the conversation over the next year, I, ho I hope you will. But what I want to invite reflection on today is one of those six proposed values, interdependence, especially in the practice of community life. And to talk about interdependence, I wanna talk about Eleanor Ostrom. To talk about Eleanor Ostrom, who is a political economist uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 2009, uh, to talk about Eleanor Ostrom, I want to talk about the tragedy of the commons. In a way, we just heard about the tragedy of the commons in the fable of the church kitchen sink. The tragedy of the commons goes like this. When villagers have something they manage together, like a grazing pasture for their animals, inevitably one of the villagers will be selfish and begin to purchase more animals who will graze the commons more aggressively depleting the resources, and what will happen among these neighbors is sort of a livestock arms race in which neighbors stockpile farm animals until the grazing pasture is ruined. That dismal cycle is taken as a given among humans and is called the tragedy of the humans or why we can't have nice things because people are gonna people. The solution to the tragedy of the commons, goes the thinking, is some mechanism of external control. People on the political right say that this external control looks like privatizing the, graz the grazing pasture and setting up rules to govern the pasture according to private ownership. People on the left, the political left, say that external control looks like controlling the space through uh, top-down uh, government law or code uh, that can be uh, enforced by the threat of police or the court system. Either way, the idea is that the villagers can't possibly govern themselves as a group to manage the grazing pasture. These assumptions are so embedded in the structure of society that it seems absurd or naive to question them. The tragedy of the commons for years was taken as a given in political and economic discourse. And then came Eleanor Ostrom with decades of research that said, not so fast. Eleanor Ostrom uh, 
conducted her research from the 1960s up until her death in 2012. With the support of many graduate students, she observed local communities all over the world to see how they managed these common resources. This included Japanese and Swiss communities managing pastures, or Spanish and Philippine communities managing irrigation, or forests in Nepal and India, or community fisheries on the coasts of Canada and Sri Lanka. Even neighborhoods here in the United States managing neighborhood crime. Those of you who play pickup basketball or pickup soccer, you'll know how these groups work as well, these self-governing groups. What Ostrom and her researchers found were countless examples of communities that successfully managed resources together over generations. In other words, while the conventional wisdom of the tragedy of the commons says, in the end, people are going to exploit the situation, push their advantage, so you need to privatize or impose state control, successful self-governing communities around the world showed otherwise that you didn't need those things. Ostrom identified eight core design principles present in these flourishing and self-governing communities, and I'll share only a few. First, groups need to define clear boundaries. Who is in the community and what together exactly are they managing? Next, participation. Those affected by the rules have a say in creating and revising them. Also, graduated sanctions. Those who violate the rules receive consequences from other community members, which begin lightly and grow over time. For instance, a first transgression might be met with only a raised eyebrow from a respected elder, which says, I see you doing that, and that ain't cool. So there's a sense of proportion in response and, and graduation over time. It's a, it's a developmental rather than a punitive response when somebody messes up. Another principle is clearly defined means of conflict resolution, which people can access quickly. And again, uh, think of how disputes in pickup basketball are resolved. There is not a table rolled out on the court with a tribunal set up. Uh, people can figure out how to do it pretty quickly uh, so they can get on with the game. Other principles uh, are about the group protecting its right to govern itself, uh, while also relating to other levels of, of governance within it, which it's nested, like a denomination or uh, a city. While most, uh, when most or all of these principles of groups uh, are in place, Ostrom and her researchers observed a group can sustainably govern itself, adapting and updating its rules over time. Speaking of evolution uh, and, and adaptation, late in Ostrom's career, around the time that she won the 2009 Nobel Prize, she was recognized uh, uh, and, and recruited by an unexpected academic partner, David Sloan Wilson. Wilson is an evolutionary biologist and a leading voice for the perspective of multi-level selection. Whereas earlier, some claim that evolution happened at the individual level or even lower at the level of the gene. Multi-level selection showed how evolution functioned at the level of the whole group. Um, reading Ostrom's work on self-governing groups, David Sloan Wilson, this biologist, recognized that the traits that she had identified in self-governing human communities, whether managing forests or fisheries, had a lot of resonance with the traits that evolutionary biologists had identified in groups that successfully adapted and survived across evolution. In other words, Wilson suggested, Ostrom had not only discovered principles for successful political organization, she had discovered some deeper truths about group survival true in the deeper process of life itself. So it's important in a sermon, especially as one approaches what might be the merciful end, to ask the question, so what? So what? All this stuff about Eleanor Ostrom. So what? So what that this political scientist saw all these villagers managing forests and fisheries in this particular way? So what that that evolutionary biologist recognized some deeper truths in her findings? So what? As members of families and communities and a country, 
coming through this side of COVID and this side of an angry and accelerated onset to a new century, many days it can seem that our heart is not in a holy place. Many days it can seem that the circle of care has been irrevocably broken. So I can sing, break not the circle. But in a way, it becomes a lament because in my daily life, I wonder if that horse has already left the barn. And as I and my beloveds are controlled by others, I ask myself, why not resort to the tactics of control myself, ourselves? If we are punched and oppressed, why not seek the modes of punching back and oppression ourselves? As a Unitarian Universalist, though, Eleanor Ostrom's work challenges me to practice interdependence. Darn it. I can't talk about interdependence on Sundays in my UU congregation and then go out, spend the rest of the week living out the assumptions of the tragedy of the commons, believing that people are inherently selfish, untrustworthy, and must be controlled. Yes, I've seen how cruel people can be to each other. I read the news. I know about suffering and how we create it for ourselves and each other. So I'm not saying that people are always at their best. I'm saying that trying to control each other or to shut each other out just isn't the solution, whether with a dirty church kitchen sink or a neighborhood experiencing crime or a quarreling family. Yes, those inclusive town meetings in Vermont are infamously long. I myself left the Quakers in my 20s after one too many long, long meetings, listening to each other. And red harvester ant colonies in the desert southwest might not seem the most inspiring creatures to model one's life on with the way that they uh, share information and adapt slowly to the environment. But these group processes of thinking and communicating and deciding in ways that involve a broad swath of people and distribute responsibility and participation across the whole community instead of only a select and sometimes irritated few are not only savvy ways to create buy-in, they are successful strategies for how groups survive in challenging and volatile environments. In an era when congregations are closing their doors every week, and if you haven't read that news, catch up on it. In this era where congregational life is, uh, is dwindling in our culture and is needed, I would say, more than ever, what does it take to slow down in the face of the problem and to include a broader circle of thinking and deciding, to foster channels and moments of relationship, to listen to one another, whether about dirty coffee mugs or about different views on the budget or even different core values, to ask what were you thinking and then stick around for the answer to actually listen. In a time when families are splintering and resorting to tactics of cutoff or lashing out, what does it take to restore the channels of relationship and to plan Thanksgiving in a way that expects everybody involved to take part in establishing how things will happen? In an age when democracy itself seems on the brink of failure with warning lights flashing, what does it take to avoid responding out of anxiety with the tactics of control? but instead with the principles of sustainable group functioning, neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, nation by nation. Our universalist ancestors may seem quaint with their conviction that nothing could separate a soul from the eternal love at the heart of creation, which will not let you go and which leaves nobody out. But what I'm talking about is putting that universalist faith into practice, aligning our practices with the habits at the heart of everything. As we careen toward the 4th of July this Tuesday, the founding principles of this country likewise may seem quaint and outdated with the idea that people could govern themselves without need of a king or some other external or top-down control. But what I'm talking about is putting radical democracy back into practice, the kind of democracy that community organizers will tell you about, the kind that ant colonies practice, the kind that flourishing families practice. Interdependence in the end isn't flashy. 
You don't get a parade, you don't get a trophy. But as Eleanor Ostrom observed in communities and as David Sloan Wilson saw across nature, it's the strategy by which we take part in a process where in the end, as the faithful ones will tell you again and again, no matter the headlines of the day, love wins. May this belief send you faithful and renewed out into the trials of this coming week.